welcome everyone. We're excited to see you here today. Thanks so much for joining us for this Climate, Le Climate Leaders webinar. This is part of a series uh, that we've been doing over the last year, highlighting climate leaders. We started out uh, with some local leaders and now we're expanding uh, to uh, beyond our borders. Excited to have uh, Lara here um, from Washington State and uh, eventually we may be moving, uh, moving even beyond. So for those of you who are not familiar with Green Belt Alliance, we are a San Francisco Bay Area focused organization. Uh, our mission is to educate, advocate and collaborate to ensure the Bay Area's lands and communities are resilient to a changing climate. We're thrilled to have today, Lara Hansen, Chief Scientist and Executive Director of EcoAdapt uh, which is based in Washington State. Lara thinks climate change is everybody's problem and she wishes someone would bother to do something about it. Hi, Lara. Great to have you here. Hi, Amanda. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to join. Uh, so what we get to talk about today is what we can do about it. Uh, but before we jump into some of the questions and conversations, I wanted to get us on the same page with some of the terminology we're using. We, uh, since we work on climate change a lot, we throw around these terms like mitigation, adaptation, and resilience, and we thought it would be helpful to step back and get on the same page about what we mean uh, about all these terms. So first, when we talk about mitigation, climate mitigation, we're really talking about slowing the rate of global warming. What can we do to reduce our pollution, our greenhouse gas emissions that slow the effects that we're already feeling relating to a changing climate? Adaptation, climate adaptation. Well, like I said, because we know we're already seeing the effects of climate change, we need to adapt our communities. We need to adapt our physical environment. This can sometimes mean things that we call nature-based solutions, say uh, protecting green belts around cities to create a buffer for, to protect us from wildfire. And they can sometimes mean investments such as seawalls or detention basins that reduce flood risk. So finally, what do we mean when we say climate resilience? Resilience is really, we're talking about how are we helping communities better prepare to bounce back in the face of a climate disaster? How are we investing in those economic and social infrastructures that particularly allow us to ensure that our most vulnerable communities are not most affected by the climate disasters we know we're facing and how we can bounce back uh, and bounce back better in, um, in the face of these disasters. So with that context, I just wanted to start out by uh, jumping to this discussion. Why is this relevant for us, particularly uh, in, in anticipation of Earth Day tomorrow? And I just want to throw in that I think I love that you've just coined bouncing back better as opposed to building back better. <laughs> um, the term resilience has been used in climate change in a lot of different ways. Um, and I love the framing you put in that because it both works inside the definition and outside the definition. So you can think about adaptation as having three components, three, three pathways, which really are sort of complementary pieces. One of them is resilience, which is about how do you, uh, people often talk about it being like a willow and bending with the change and responding and bouncing back rather than breaking. The other two ends of it are um, uh, resistance, which is how do we make it so we don't feel the change, um, which is usually very engineered solutions, not in the nature-based model um, and has very hard breaking points. Um, and then the other one is response, which is where you just leave and go do something else. The sweet spot is resilience. The sweet spot is how do we continue to live with the earth um, in a manner that is truly sustainable and sustainable in the face of that change that is ahead of all of us. So um, thank you for, for coining the bounce back better. And hopefully we can get the Biden administration to make building back better all about bouncing back better because I think there's such a, a beautiful opportunity there. Um, so uh, going on with Earth Day and with that theme um, is this 
getting people to plan in a manner that isn't just spatial. We spend so much of our time thinking very spatially. So how do we expand that to do that temporal component that allows us to not only bounce back, but even like be prepared for the bouncing we need to do in the future. Um, so how do we start planning and designing for tomorrow as opposed to the planning and designing that we've been doing for yesterday, not even really for today anymore. There are designs you can see being put in place in local planning that are not relevant to the experiences we all know that we're having right now. Um, even restoration projects where species are being replanted that are either have been part of the fire problem in California or we know aren't gonna be doing well with changing um, hydrological conditions. Um, we need, to, and there's such a responsibility in doing that at two levels. There's sort of the, the near-term fiscal responsibility of how do we ensure that taxpayer dollars and individuals' dollars are being spent in a manner that will have long-standing value. Um, but then there's sort of the responsibility to the earth. How do we make decisions that will allow ecosystem, the ecosystems that surround us and support us to continue to be able to deliver the kinds of services, clean water, clean air, um, access to experience with nature, habitat for biodiversity. How do we ensure all of those happen by not making decisions to create that resistance model for our protection that doesn't benefit those? Um, one of the tools that um, brought our conversation together um, was a tool called the Climate Change Adaptation Certification, um, which we've used with communities, uh, not only uh, around the country, but also down in the Bay Area, um, which is just a simple tool that can anyone can use that will guide you to the kind of information you need to determine whether or not climate change is having an effect. And um, we often use this after a community has updated a general plan, but in point of fact, it could be used before that happens or just if you decide I wanna make a good decision on something that has a long lifespan. If you're building something or developing a plan that has a 10, 15, 50, 100 year lifespan, you wanna make sure you're planning for climate change as part of that. So I think this is this is a great tool, and as you mentioned, this is something that I think was particularly interesting to us and how we uh, connected with you and your work. And I think the other thing that we found interesting and exciting about the way you frame your work is this, how are we taking action? Uh, and so just wanted to talk a little bit and hear from you a little bit about uh, how we take these concepts, I know sometimes when we spend all day talking about climate change, it can feel very overwhelming and very big mm -hmm. for us here uh, to say, what can we do about something that has these global uh, implications? So uh, how do you think about what types of action we can take uh, here at this local level and beyond? Yeah, so there's, I mean, there's a couple, it, climate change is absolutely overwhelming. Climate change is, it's ubiquitous and it is here in perpetuity. Like it is, it, it is, it has both the spatial and the temporal forever. Um, and it, it can be, it can seem like taking it on is another big additional piece of what has to happen in the world. Part of how um, my team and I personally try to engage people on this is start with what it is you already do. What, what is the suite of responsibilities or concerns you already have? and start by considering how will climate change affect those and how can I do them in a way that will allow them to continue to successfully deliver my goal in the face of climate change. And sometimes it may mean your goal is gonna need to change, but oftentimes it just means how you're going about trying to achieve your goal or how you're designing it um, needs to be a little bit different. And that needs to happen at the personal work level. So at that very local level, um, both in within organizations and within communities. And in the Bay Area, there's a, there's a group that I work with that refers to it as climate wokeness. And in the Bay Area, you have like the full spectrum of climate wokeness communities, but none of them have arrived at their destination. Like everyone is still trying to figure out how to best integrate climate. And that will be something that's gonna be ongoing because we know that climate change is full of surprises. 
So you can look to your neighboring communities and figure out what they're doing and different communities are doing better on different aspects of how they're planning for it. Are they planning for it in terms of uh, how climate change affects people? Are they planning for it in how it affects infrastructure? Are they planning for it in how it affects the resources that they need, um, be it where they where your water comes from, which much in the Bay Area is not arriving locally, um, uh, where food comes from, where energy comes from, like that whole mix. So that gets you up to the state level often, and you're in a state where there is concern and there is mandate, but you need to keep supporting that. Um, a lot of the climate planning frame in California has been set around disaster response because you've had some pretty serious ones. I mean, the fire issues in California and water issues in California tend to pop up as these disaster frames. So how do we shift from a disaster frame to a pre-disaster mitigation frame so that we're avoiding the disaster by planning for what that long-term future looks like? Then obviously we have to go up to the national level and we have like a burgeoning happening right now. It is really exciting to watch the Biden-Harris administration taking off on issues around climate change, both mitigation and adaptation and resilience. Um, not entirely certain how all of that's gonna come into play, but there's a lot of stuff in place, including your bounce back better opportunity in the infrastructure <laughs> bill. Um, and then as, as we're speaking, um, there's a global climate summit hosted by the White House ramping up um, that will be going on for the rest of the week um, where we're gonna hopefully re-engage at the national, in the international level, because at the heart of it, despite the fact the US has tremendous greenhouse gas emissions, like we, we're still responsible for the majority of where we are today in this problem. Um, it is a glo it's a genuinely global problem. And there are some other countries and economies that are vying for uh, the greatest polluting uh, source, not a, not a title I'd want. Um, and we need to figure out how we get there together. And more importantly, there are all of the countries that are being disproportionately impacted by the emissions that have happened um, out of the industrialization of the world based on a fossil fuel economy. So how do we transition away from that fossil fuel economy? And how do we um, protect and uh, respond for the responsibilities for the damages that are being done, not only to the communities in this country um, and the frontline communities in this country as we refer to those who are the most impacted and the least advantaged by it, but how do we take that same responsibility globally, um, which is also on our shoulders. Yeah, I do think, as you mentioned, with all of these pieces converging, we are at a unique and different moment for those of us who've been thinking about this for a while. There does seem to be more focus, more attention. And, you know, as you mentioned here in California, uh, with the unfortunate set of overlapping disasters that we're feeling, it does feel like people are starting to connect the dots and say, okay, what can we do about this? At the same time, I think at the local government level, we often uh, the level of uncertainty that we need to deal with is very overwhelming. Uh, you know, engineers like to say, what's the problem we're solving? Like, and how do we solve it? So now we really do have to look at what are places that are doing creative things, bringing in innovative ideas, thinking about those models. Uh, I know that's a great resource that you all uh, bring is uh, compiling models, pilots, and ideas that others uh, can learn from. Would love to hear a little bit about uh, some of the things our communities here in uh, the Bay Area in Northern California are doing um, that we should be watching and thinking about uh, or how we model that for the rest of our communities. Yeah, you bet. Um, so the Climate Adaptation Knowledge Exchange is one of the tools that you were talking about, which is cakex.org. Um, and it is the, the world's largest climate change adaptation database. We refer to it as your online adaptation destination. Mm -hmm. um, and it's free, open access. Um, you can go in through the map. And I took a little screenshot of all the case studies that are in the greater Bay Area. Um, those dots are multiple dots underneath them. You can't zoom in and show the full picture all at the mm -hmm. same time. Um, and you can read case studies about those projects. You can also identify the the, the reports that have been written um, in the region and the tools that are relevant for the region. I've just chosen to look at the case studies. 
the great thing about adaptation is that often it's taking ideas that have already existed and repurposing them or modifying them. I often talk about climate change adaptation being like improvisational jazz. So there's classical music, which uses a set score and uses the same instruments as jazz does. So jazz has the same interest, the instruments, the same notation. It just did something totally different with them and it changes all the time. It doesn't keep doing the same thing. So you can look at things that have been in place in some communities in the Bay Area for a long time. And one of those examples is the, the green belt in Davis, California. So a little bit outside the Bay Area, but the Bay Area has widened. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that has been a, the, the system of bike paths and trails that that community put in place forever ago now um, still is reaping the reward of making that a, an accessible community and a community where fewer people drive, which it means it has lower emissions and it means it has greater mobility of younger uh, community members and potentially improved air quality. Um, and it also means that you can have uh, a green belt that can provide connectivity, although in their case, it's a little bit more perky. So it's a different kind of connectivity and it's in an agricultural landscape. So, but that model of how do you build that green belt transit piece together is a really important part about how we rethink about community development. Not a brand new tool, but something that you could modify for other purposes. And I've talked to a number of communities who still look at Davis when they're trying to figure out how to do something similar. Um, on the habitat restoration side, there's a great example that's been going on for a number of years that we've actually been able to monitor over time, which is the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project. So historically, it was used for industrial production of salt. Um, those salt ponds were given, were seeded back to become natural habitat. And they created an incredible plan for not only restoring that habitat, but also it has built into it thinking about things like sea level rise and what does that mean for the functionality of that habitat. And in some cases, the role of that habitat in some ways ameliorating impacts on the built environment. Um, in San Francisco, uh, there's the, 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 the great highway in the front of Golden Gate Park. Um, has some really important infrastructure underneath it. There's a, um, a water supply, a, a water and sewage supply pipe that runs through there that is um, at, at risk because that shorefront continued to erode um, because of natural erosion processes, but also because of sea level rise. Um, and so there is a process in place there where that, that road is going to be decommissioned as a road and it is going to become an access path and the street traffic is going to be diverted around and back farther away from shore. And there's going to be a lot of work like that in all of our communities. How do we deal with the erosion of beachfront roads? Um, and oftentimes they're very crucial links and we need to come up with another way for things to move um, on and around. Um, so a lot of cool stuff going on. The natural resource world down in the South Bay um, to how we rethink transportation. Um, there's also uh, work afoot in some areas, rethinking how do you better design um, affordable housing so that you can ensure that affordable housing um, also uh, maintains its affordability in the changing parameters of the environment. Um, historically, the Bay Area has not required a lot of air conditioning. Um, air conditioning is expensive, it's energy intensive. How do you build affordable housing that is passively cooled so that you do not have to have high cooling bills, but you can maintain comfortable temperatures, which means rethinking the traditional designs that we've used, especially on low income housing projects where we haven't been particularly creative in um, our design and implementation, but it can't be affordable housing if it's just built cheaply because the cost of living in it will be far too great. Thank you so much. I think it's great to see uh, kind of what um, some of our communities are doing and uh, Greenbelt Alliance in our mission uh, is thinking about, I think that your example in Davis was, was really uh, helpful in, in that framing of work that they've been doing for a long time. How do we build, uh, 
how can we enhance our existing infrastructure to build climate resilience? That's something we've been thinking a lot about. For example, we've worked for many years on creating urban growth boundaries uh, around cities, ensuring that uh, cities focus their growth within uh, their communities and create those, those buffer zones, protect our existing farmlands and beautiful open spaces. And we're looking now at how that does potentially increase our resilience to wildfire um, by permanently protecting and stewarding uh, those lands um, to create those wildfire breaks, uh, as well as ensuring that as we're building affordable housing, both uh, building in what type of housing is reducing our greenhouse gas impacts, and then also ensuring that we're not building in places that we know are going to be vulnerable moving forward. So I think that's another key, key thing for us as we think about how we're using our land, where we're building, where we're not building. Uh, and in California, your greatest your greatest contribution to greenhouse gas emissions is transportation. And so anytime you can decrease the amount of vehicle miles traveled and the amount of infrastructure that needs to be built to support that um, is super important. Um, and despite the fact that you will be transitioning to electric vehicles in California in the next couple of decades, that doesn't mean that it's um, that that's, that's going to solve all the problems. Electric vehicles still require external energy. Um, and anytime we can decrease that and increase our ability to live in a place that has the things we need, um, that'll be better for all of that surrounding area as well and decrease pressures on demands for fire suppression and things like that, which have gotten us in a worse place than we would be. Plus, when you add climate and drought to that, it multiplies it. <laughs> Yes, we, uh, we have uh, our unique uh, landscapes mean that we have lots of different climate hazards uh, here um, in our small region. So thinking a lot about how these intersect and particularly how, uh, you know, as you mentioned, you know, we're really looking at over the next um, couple of years, I just wanted to highlight uh, because you've mentioned so many of these different pieces of work we're doing. Um, for those who are interested in taking action um, here at the local level, uh, we have, you know, as you mentioned, general plans and uh, climate action plans, hazard mitigation plans, that local planning level is really key to creating those building blocks uh, to build in that adaptation and resilience. We're working on a climate resilience playbook right now that should be launched uh, later this fall that really will have some of these guidance and this rich information on uh, examples and innovative ideas that are emerging from our different communities. At the current, uh, right now, from a housing perspective and how, how we're building and where we're building, every city in the Bay Area has to update um, the, the housing element of their general plan and plan for the growth we need. We're really working on ensuring that each of those communities are thinking about where they should build, the places that are kind of at lower risk and where they shouldn't build, uh, where we know risk is gonna be. So uh, as we, um, at, you know, we just have a few minutes more, um, we'd love for anyone uh, who is interested to um, get involved, but just as a, before we let you go, I think, you know, we have had some great examples of the Bay Area uh, you have great knowledge of lots of other places as well. Is there any, you know, really amazing place that we should be looking to um, for uh, in inspiration around building climate resilience? Well, in the Bay Area, you guys through um, the Bay Conservation and Development Commission um, have had a longstanding partnership with the Netherlands, um, who clearly has a lot of thinking uh, around sea level rise. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of great stuff going on there, but really there are pockets of great resilience examples all over the place. The, the, the greatest opportunity and the greatest challenge of working on climate change, especially on adaptation, is that it really comes down to local champions who suddenly understand the vulnerability of their community or what it is they're working on and become a champion for making that change. Um, and so it's just really finding what is the what is the piece and the component that matches what you're doing. I mean, I 
I see amazing work going on all over all over the country now, even in very uh, not your usual suspect places. Um, and uh, I see great stuff going on all over the world. And the world is really quite a bit ahead of us on this. I mean, I started working in the United States it, exclusively in 2008, but prior to that, I'd been working internationally for a decade. And uh, there are people who have been recognizing this challenge and addressing it for a lot longer than we have. So look outside our borders is one of my pieces of advice to people to find um, analogous points of inspiration. And especially on the transportation and community design piece, um, there's, the, there's a lot of the world that is, has been embracing this and taking it very seriously for a long time. And not just in Europe. I mean, frequently I think people say, well, Europe's so much different because it's so compact. But you can find examples of thinking like this that's going on on quite large landscapes in other parts of the world as well. But check out CAKE, CAKEX.org, your mm -hmm. online adaptation destination, chock full of examples. Uh, yeah, that sounds great. Um, again, what, the incredible resources that uh, EcoAdapt has on their website uh, definitely helped us connect with you uh, along with the other work you're doing. And like I said, Green Belt Alliance is continuing to build um, our local resources as well. We do work uh, building toolkits and, uh, and research. And then we do that work of working with local communities on the ground to get these policies passed. So we definitely welcome anyone to reach out to us uh, or go to greenbelt.org to find out more about what we're doing and about how you can get involved. We like to do lots of local actions, allowing you to connect with your local city council members, state legislators um, to express your support for this type of work. Um, also, so uh, we just have a couple more minutes. I'd like to very much thank you, Laura, for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I think this will be the beginning of uh, lots of conversations we'll have around how we can highlight our work, highlight the work you're doing, but uh, collaborate across the entire West Coast and beyond. Um, there's a lot of similarities we have. Um, and uh, for those of you who are, are here, again, thanks so much for taking this time out of your day. Uh, Green Belt Alliance um, is a nonprofit organization and the work we do to protect the Bay Area's uh, natural and open spaces and build climate resilience is made possible uh, by donations from people like you. So please, um, if you're able, feel free to, to donate at our website and uh, follow us on all of our various social media channels and uh, and share, it looks like there was some great other resources shared in the chat. Uh, this this um, event has been recorded and will be up on our YouTube channel. And uh, please continue to have this conversation. There's a lot we need to do. This week, there's a lot of inspiring of events um, around Earth Day going on. So um, it's a chance for us to, uh, work together um, to build a more resilient future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure to join you guys. And thanks everyone for listening.